Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend, bassist for Red Cross, Off, and the Melvins, Stephen McDonald. The man, the myth, the legend, he's doing great. Yeah, you are a legend. Sure. It sounds better coming out of your mouth than mine. That's true. Don't you know that I'm a legend? Steve, what was your youth like growing up in the Beach Boys hometown of Hawthorne, California? <laughs> yeah, the Beach Boys. Well, we were all appropriately nasal like the Beach Boys. Uh, be true to your school. I was true to my school. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was a different kind of experience than what the Beach Boys were describing in like 1962-63. Hawthorne was somewhat in decline by the time I came along. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you've ever seen that movie Suburbia, and I always reference this, which I actually haven't seen the whole film, so I'm kind of embarrassed to reference it. But I know that the setting for much of the film is in a track of homes, a, a suburban neighborhood, not the same one as mine, but along the same route. So I grew up well, the house I grew up in is no longer exists. It's now under a pylon on the 105 freeway, mm. really close to LAX. And so, uh, but before it actually became a freeway, it was just a track of, of you know, uh, um, you know, working class, whatever, like you know, so, uh, suburban houses that had been vacated because the city bought all these houses as they were planning to move a freeway. I mean, to build a freeway, but they kept changing their plans. So they would buy a track of homes, vacate them, bulldoze some of them. Some of them just leave, you know, to rot. And then they would change the plan, and then suddenly they were buying another track of homes in another part of the neighborhood, and essentially my neighborhood went from being like the Beach Boys style um, Southern California that they sang about in the early 60s to more like that sort of scene of urban decay you know, or suburban decay that was depicted in the Penelope Spheres film Suburbia. What did your parents do for a living? My father is a welder. He has his own business and he, we live in the South Bay as we talked about. So that's good. The Hawthorne is in uh, what they call the South Bay area of Los Angeles and um, and it's very, um, it's always been um, an aerospace industry area. So, um, so my dad started his own business when I was, a, I don't know, an adolescent and does a lot of work for the, the aerospace and he's still working. He's 80 years old and he's totally kicking ass. Hey, were your parents supportive of you and Jeff? Oh yeah, right. So yeah, people often ask, because they hear these stories about me being in Red Cross when I was 11 years old, and they assume that I was raised on a commune, and that my parents were these really progressive hippies, and that no one ever watched us, and stuff like that. Or some kind of variation of that story. And it wasn't like that at all. Um, they were not musical people, but they were very supportive. Although Jeff and I were probably totally foreign aliens to them, being so obsessed with not only rock and roll music, but like underground rock and roll music, weird rock and roll music, especially for our age. Um, they might have been confused by us, yet uh, they still supported us. It would take a lot of begging, but um, they would drive us to shows and stuff. Um, Hawthorne is about... 15 miles from West Hollywood and back in those days well I don't know actually there still isn't really a direct freeway to West Hollywood but anyways I grew up off of Imperial Highway and La Cienega Boulevard. If you take La Cienega about 10 to 15 miles north, you eventually dead in into Sunset Boulevard in the heart of West Hollywood, um, which used to be like the Sunset Strip. Um, and I caught the, so around 1978, we were able to beg our parents to take us to the Whiskey A Go Go. And um, back in those days, they would still do, I think it was a 70s, 60s thing where a band would come and they wouldn't just play a one night stand, they would do like three or four nights it would be a residency and not only would they do a residency they would do an early show and a late show so we begged our parents to, t to take us to the whiskey to go to the early show and we saw the Avengers the San Francisco group the Avengers who were on Dangerous Records and X open for the Avengers so X were technically the first band I ever saw in a nightclub we also got them to take us to the Runaways around that time we caught the very tail end of the Runaways probably one of their last shows um, but it was still that rock and waiting for the night really rock really ramped up rock version of them and uh, uh, yeah, so stuff like that. But um, so that's how they supported us. They would just 
but they probably thought we were alien people, but they thought at least they're into something. Yeah. So let's encourage it, or at least not discourage it. How did having a grandfather who was a hero of the military industrial complex affect you and your brother? Well, you know, my grandfather was a very humble dude, and um, although he did serve in the Navy and was present at not only when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he was on one of the ships that were attacked. He was also at D-Day on, on the USS Nevada, which I recently learned he was on the same ship in uh, Europe that he was in, uh, in Pearl Harbor. Uh, he wasn't the kind of dude, and I've heard this story many times, that that generation, they, they, they're they very sort of stoic. He wasn't bragging about it. It wasn't like he was constantly reminding me to respect that he is a, a, you know, a, an American hero. Um, but the thing, the real thing, besides him being a really cool dude and um, and and being like a really great example of, uh, I don't know, just like a, an approachable version of masculinity, he was a, he was cool. Uh, he um, he was also a diehard um, Rush Limbaugh fan. Mm. Listened to him every day until the day he died, and. Uh, and but my my father is the oldest of like seven or eight, and um, I should know that number. But uh, at any rate, so his youngest siblings, my father's youngest siblings, were more like older brothers and sisters to me. My father's youngest brother is only nine years older than me, and he was into rock and roll. He bought me. Uh, we borrowed Ziggy Stardust from him on eight track in 1972, <laughs> Christmas of '72. We're like can we borrow this, me and my brother? And he's like, sure, we never gave it back. Um, but needless to say, you know, by 1973, it was a very different world, and the children my grandfather were raising, my father's younger uh, siblings, were not quite as, um, you know, conservative as my grandfather. So political conversations were sort of like the way things are in popular culture right now. You know, and people, a lot of people just kind of avoided the topic in general because it was... Uh, it just would always end up in like my hippie aunts and uncles in a fight with my grandfather. And uh, so I would say that definitely had an effect. I mean, I just kind of thought of, oh, screw all that, and I'm not going to pay attention to that much. It's only been in recent years I've been forced to deal with uh, the state of how things get run in the world. And um, How is that? Well, how how is it that I've been forced to deal with it? Yeah. Or well, I think it's just it's just well. For one thing, I'm a I'm a parent now, and uh, you know, and I just said things have been so extreme in uh, with the with the with the election a couple years ago, and everyone just really has a, a strong point of view, or many people do, way more so than ever in my life, and so I just find myself. Um, you know, I've got to, unless I just have to be passive and follow who has ever got the strongest opinion in my life, I probably should really like do some of my homework and figure out what is going on. And I myself, I've always just kind of this more default liberal point of view, just because probably more than anything, the music that I grew up loving, you know, that same uncle got me Rock and Roll Animal by Lou Reed the next Christmas after he learned that we loved Ziggy Stardust. I was drinking in this real weirdo outsiderness stuff from a very young age. So, and that that people that are in that world typically tend to just, you know, lean to a, a more uh, progressive side of of that kind of decision making in the world and. Uh, but I mean, I think in recent years I've had to go, okay, well, you can't just passively accept that that's where your point of view is. Figure it out more, you know? And, and you have to be able to substantiate it with something other than just like, I like to wave my freak flag. And so, yeah, I've been more challenged by that in recent years. How did your first band, The Tourists, form? Uh, well, so The Tourists started when I was 11, and my brother, Jeff, he's three and a half years older than me, and uh, we had talked my parents into getting me a Fender Music Master bass, an electric bass. Jeff had managed to, from his job at the fish and chip shop, gotten a $50 Stratocaster copy. Amy wrote essentially the, the lion's share of our first EP, um, like Annette's Got the Hits and I Hate My School, and all those songs. And then Jeff was in, uh, in his, he was in high school and I was going, I was still in sixth grade, Jeff would have been in ninth or tenth grade, and uh, in his photography class, he noticed there was another kid that were taking pictures of um, 
punk rock bands, which was really re weird and rare at that point. This is like late 78, early 79 in the suburbs in Hawthorne. And uh, so he struck up a conversation with that kid and uh, turned out he played guitar. Also turns out it's Greg Hetson who, who later, after leaving Red Cross, later started the Circle Jerks and there was some bad religion too. So by odd coincidence, Jeff and Greg found each other and Jeff explained to Greg that he was starting a band and Greg was like, oh, that's cool. He's like, yeah, my brother, me and my brother, my brother's 11. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that Greg probably thought he was kidding or something and then Greg came to our house one day and we were showing him like Annette's got the hits. Da, 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 na, 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 na. And Greg was probably totally like baffled but you could tell that we actually were um, motivated and the other really awesome bonus about Greg is he had a pickup truck so it meant we could actually like move our stuff and go somewhere with it and so that's basically how it started and then you know, for drummer for drums we had this kid named John Stilo who was in the school orchestra with me that's how I got my bass I joined the school orchestra and I played stand-up for a year and once I could show my parents that I could play King of the Road don 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 they were like, whoa, wow, we have a musician in the family. So then we begged them endlessly, like Bart Simpson times a million, please, 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 a bass, an electric bass. And uh, so the kid that played drums in the orchestra that did the drum solo before our ripping version of Hawaii Five O in the Wiseburn School Orchestra, there was this drum solo, it was like total, probably total Bob, Bobby Brady style drum solo. His name was uh, John Stilo, and we just recruited him. He was the only kid we knew with a drum set. And he was 13, I was 11, my brother was 15, and Greg was 17 or something. And that was the tourist, and that's the band that we first <coughs> opened for Black Flag at Pollywog Park. Then they came and played a, a high, uh, junior high school graduation party in Hawthorne with us. Like, we got them the gig. It was this classmate of John Stilo's class and um, the drummer. And, uh, and that was the beginnings of the band. And then, um, and then soon after, Black Flag invited us to play a real show with them in Hollywood and uh, but it just turned out that John Stilo couldn't play the show it was actually in Chinatown because his family was away on vacation so we just like we actually found another drummer who turned out to be Ron Reyes um, who was friends with Black Flag who later became a singer for Black Flag so and he didn't know how to play drums but he just like willing to give it a try and so, uh, and so when we just when we did that, we around that time we also found out that there was another band called the Tourist from England, which turned out to be this new wave band. It was a pre uh, Eurythmics, yeah, pre Eurythmics yeah. band. And uh, so, at any rate, we we changed our name to a band name that we thought would go well with Black Flag. So Black cool. Flag, Red Cross. How did you guys come to practice at the legendary? Community Baptist Church in Hormosa Beach. Yeah, also just kind of known as the church. Um, yeah, well, so I've already mentioned Black Flag, and uh, during the tourist days, which is really the, the, the first six months of me being in a band, um, we found out about a show happening in our neighborhood, which was really rare, um, in Hermosa Beach at a, um, at a, at a Moose Lodge. And um, it was um, two bands we loved. They were on Dangerous Records. One was Rhino 39, another one was the Alley Cats. And, uh, and so we just went. We, we talked to our parents, and this one was an easy one because it was only in Hermosa Beach, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't that far away. And they took us, or maybe Greg Hudson was in the picture then. We might have been able to go with Greg. But at any rate, um, opening for these bands was this unknown, obnoxious local band that we didn't know anything about and they just played as loud as you could ever imagine these amplifiers to go. The lead singer um, got kicked out of the venue because he, he pulled the American flag down from the wall at this Moose Lodge and a couple of the old timers that were kind of just hanging out to see what these kids were doing, these kids that had rented out their hall, were like, that's not cool, you know, and they, I mean, he was a wasted drunk and it turned out to be Keith Morris and, um, at any rate, so they had, I think they had already 
just released themselves their very first EP, the Nervous Breakdown EP, and um, on the back of that record it said SST and it had an, a Hermosa Beach address. And we were like, holy shit, there's another band, this band, who to be honest I didn't really like that much that night. I thought they were kind of obnoxious but and really muddy sounding. Like I said, I just really wanted to see Round on 39 and the Alley Cats, but um, I later I later grew to love Black Flag. Um, but at first, they're probably scary to me. You know, we were just really tenacious, and um, and when we saw that address, we just called information, and we got um, and we called information looking for SST Electronics, Ele SST Electronics in Hermosa Beach, and Greg Ginn answered the phone, and uh, my brother would always just like. He'd pimp me out. He'd be like, hey, you know, hey, cool, is this Black Flag? Well, we have a band. We're from Hawthorne, and my little brother's 11 years old. He's in the group. And, uh, you know, we're always, it was basically sort of Kim Fowley tactics. Yeah. It was this old school sort of showmanship. And, uh, cause, you know, in the, in the first Runaways record that opened the gatefold, it said each of their ages. Greg was just like, kind of laughing. I probably thought I might have, might have thought it was a crank call, but it's like, why don't you guys just like come, we're rehearsing tomorrow night or something, why don't you guys just come down? And um, so we went down to that church where he ran SST. I think a bunch of the guys were living there. You know, it wasn't zoned for living. And, um, you know, it was pretty like rough, you know. And because uh, it was this church that had been abandoned and sort of like been taken over by a bunch of hippies that lived upstairs and Keith has told me recently that they maybe had like a stained glass company or something but um anyways so it was them and then this like juxtaposition was a bunch of derelict punk rockers we're living down in the basement of this thing or in the other areas and uh and in one of the rooms they had a rehearsal room you know with all the ugly shag carpet taped to the wall we just got to sit down and watch them rip through their first set of songs and then when they were done, they just kind of handed us their guitars and like, you're a band? Okay, let's see it. You know, a little John Steele behind Robo's, Vista Light, yeah. massive shells. And I strapped on Chuck Dukowski's Ibanez Flying V bass that was probably as big as me. And, you know, we played our originals and we did a couple of covers then. I remember we did Who Are the Mystery Girls by The Dolls and we did a, sort of this fun punk rock version of I Want to Hold Your Hand. And they were just, they were, they were impressed or charmed or maybe they saw some unique potential for us or novelty or whatever, but they were like, cool, man. And then, yeah, that's how it is. I always joke that we auditioned to hang out with Black Flag. We auditioned to be their friends. It was early days for that scene and, you know, Black Flag were virtually unknown. It was this really neat little uh, insulated you know, island of misfit toys that had co been collected there. And uh, it was just a s small group of weirdos from the South Bay. And some of them were in bands and some weren't. Essentially, how did Kicking Ron Reyes out of the band put a new face to Black Flag and then create the Circle Jerks? Well, Ron Reyes didn't, we didn't kick him out. He quit the band. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, uh, the chain of events are uh, Ron quits Red Cross. Um, and it was like this ridiculous thing, you know, it was like my brother was drunk, it was at a show, and these girls were putting magic marker, like Egyptian line magic marker, sort of like Iggy Stooge on him, and Ron's like, oh, fucking lead singers wear makeup, I'm not going on stage with a you know, it was like so stupid, and then he quit the band ceremoniously, he has since apologized, you know, it was ridiculous, but um, so then, around that same time, um, Keith either quit or was sort of like edged out of black flag for whatever political reason was going on there. And um, so around that same time, uh, Greg Hedson finds uh, Lucky Lear, um, who later starts Circle Jerks with Greg, and he brings him down to our house, my parents' house, my bedroom, and my parents' house, um, to audition to play in Red Cross. And Lucky is a sweet guy. He's also probably about 24 at this time. I'm 12 years old. I think he's a law student. And um, he seemed really square and he seemed very adult. And like, and then he said, and they pulled out his drum kit and he had these like crazy North drums, which are like, they look like big bugles. Yeah. They're like big horns, like, like this, you know? And he had, he had these big North drums 
and then he got behind the kid and he could actually really play with like professional and it just felt really awkward to me and Jeff was like this can't be our new drummer this is like not right and um, so after the rehearsal we told Greg like yeah yeah that yeah you know thanks for bringing him down but I don't think it's the right five and then Greg was so annoyed with us and I understand and Greg was really excited he found this drummer that really kicked ass that no one knew about and so Greg's like well I don't know and then and then around that same time, I don't know what the order of events were. I've tried to piece this together with Keith in recent years, but at some point, Keith and when Keith, after Keith is sort of nudged out a black flag, Greg is annoyed that we don't want Lucky in our band. Those two are probably kind of commiserating, and they were just like, "Let's start our, let's start a new band." And so next thing you know, Circle Jerks had started, and Greg was like, you know. Sorry, I'm out of here. So it's just fair. And um, but then the weird thing was when Circle Jerks first played their first set of shows, half of the set were like much of the Black Flag set that Greg, that the Keith had been playing with Black Flag. Maybe some of it was just the lyrics, but sometimes it was the music that he didn't write. And then the other part, much of part of the other set, the rest of the set were Red Cross songs. And sometimes they change lyrics. Well, as you know, the da na 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 that makes it onto the first Circle Jerks album. That's on the first e Red Cross EP. That was actually one of the riffs that Greg brought into Red Cross. But then we find out many years later that he he actually had brought in that from the band he had been in before Red Cross. We didn't know someone else had written that. But um, actually, following James from Leaving Trains. In a nutshell, it all just kind of happened probably within a week, couple couple weeks time that Black Flag moved Keith out of the band and then Lucky and Lucky showed up in Greg's life and then they were both pissed off with both their camps and started Circle Jerks and then and then around that time you know because Ron lived in the basement in the church in the Decline movie all that all that footage of them keep Black Flag being interviewed in the room with spray paint on the walls that was Ron's room in the church where we used to rehearse when Ron was in the band and so it was just sort of a natural progression for him to start singing for Black Flag. Was it you and your brother against the world during that period? Or do you feel like you were part of a tight musical community? Well, during that brief period where we were hanging out with the Black Flag people, I mean, we were definitely a part of their world, you know. They were much older than us, and they made the rules. And, um, and that's kind of what happened. That's around the time when Black Flag really started to be embraced by the Orange County scene and the hardcore movement was starting to coalesce and become something. And that's around the time that we were kind of like, yeah, yeah, I don't know about this. And then um, we started wanting to, you know, reflect more of the music that we grew up with. Stuff like, you know, The Runaways, New York Dolls, and not only just pay homage to them by covering a tuner now now and then. We went to put on a show and we went to dress up and be rock stars. You know, during that that initial era, you know, I don't know if that was Black Flag's decision or I mean now if they sort of created this, but it's like that was the biggest insult you could say to anybody is call them a rock star. You know, that and poser, I guess they were the interchangeable because, you know, uh, the, the the poser meant you had to be authentic to not be a poser. And if you put together, if you put on some outrageous outfit to go on the stage, well then, then that was somehow inauthentic. That was made you not, um, made you a rock, you know, a rock star in the lame sense, a poser. And I think we decided at some point that, you know, that, that commandment. I like the escapism of, you know, the first concert I ever went to before I went and saw X and the Avengers. I saw Kiss in 75 at the Forum when I was eight or nine years old, and it's, you know, changed my life, you know, it was on their first Alive. It was a serious, um, memorable production, and uh, so I think we thought it would be cool to blend these elements, you know, and uh, still hold on to the punk rock uh, sensibility and, you know, the aggressive approach towards playing music, but do it with all the fun and the enthusiasm of a lot of the groups we grew up with. How did the deal with Posh Boy Records come about for the Red Cross EP? We played a show at the um, in Chinatown I mentioned earlier, opening for Black Flag, and he was just you know Posh Boy. I think maybe the 
Beach Boulevard record or one of those something. He'd put something out. Maybe the uh, the F Word Live record. And um, so he was just this guy on, on the scene and he saw us play like our first ever show and snatched us up. So what inspired the song Cellulite City? Well, that song was sort of inspired by a thing that happened to me when I was like about 13 where I ran away from home. I was kind of like kidnapped and um, this one's really hard to put into a nutshell because it's a really it was this big epic journey that happened to me where I had a girlfriend that was much older than me and uh, it was not very appropriate <laughs> and things kind of went astray and I ended up finding myself in a situation where I was being threatened to become a parent at 12 years old unless I ran away from home. That's sort of how that went down. And uh, so, yeah. And so I thought, you know, let's just do this. And I ran away from home for about three months until my parents found me. And so it was this big epic journey. But um, yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of discussed in a very abstract form in that song, I'm Born Innocent. You weren't tortured, were you? I was not tortured. No, not at all. It was this girlfriend, she's now deceased, and she was just crazy. You know, she was like 24. She was sort of a leftover from the, uh, the glitter scene in L.A., and she was one of the first punk rockers in L.A., and I was enamored with her, and, uh, but she obviously had a screw loose. I mean, I may have been a little bit precocious, you know, being in a rock band and everything at a young age, but I was still a 12-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I know in our culture, we sort of think of like a 12-year-old boy, it's like, you got a high five, that's like my tutor, man, fuck yeah, when I was 12. But the thing was, it was still like not a great thing because the power dynamic was off. I had I admired her beyond you know I was sort of like at I was not it, uh, it was not at a level playing field with this person it turned me on to great music and great literature but a lot of it was a lot of what she was feeding me was sort of to tell this story about how the rest of the outside world doesn't understand us and that you know and it was, it was a bit of like a Stockholm Syndrome kind of situation. No, I wasn't tortured or anything, but I was definitely blackmailed. I was told that if I didn't f run away with her, she was going to have my child. I was only 12 years old or 13 years old, and I was like, holy shit, no. And so her and her, her parent, her mother and her crazy mother's boyfriend kind of devised this plan to move to Las Vegas. I mean, they were uh, adults. I mean, even if sh she was their daughter, was like I thought, like, I don't know. At any rate, you know, they had, they had me convinced that every one of them, that they would be thrown in prison forever if I ever, if I, if I told and called my parents. So it was just a, it was a very, it was a very weird experience. And uh, it definitely, um, it was definitely one of the cons of being so, um, being, you know, living in a world so much older than me, you know, being, be, being a little too advanced for my age. That's heavy, bro. Yeah. Linda Blair has been such a hardcore, repetitive theme in a lot of the early Red Cross records. I'm wondering how in love with Linda Blair were you? Yeah, very in love. Uh, you know, she was, uh, it was a very interesting character because, um, she, she's a little bit older than me, but my, my brother's age, in our age group, and seemed like this like regular, normal kid, adolescent. But then you knew there was this crazy, you know, there's this scene you can't ever see, you know? The exorcist. The exorcist scene, the masturbation with the rose, with the, with the, with the, cruci the crucifix. So there's an element of danger. You know, and then and whatever, and then she went on to make all these TV movies after that, where she was like a teenage alcoholic, and then a, or a kid that's in a reform school, and she just kind of became this kind of um, anti-hero, you know, um, to suburban kids. And I think that it had a profound effect on my brother and myself because, in some ways, you know, it's hard to not be. Um, drawn to the danger and this badness, especially when it's coming from a normal kid just like yourself, you know, it's cute. And then just the sheer, you know, cool rock and roll quality of The Exorcist, you know, it's like, you know, listening to Black Sabbath, you know, and, and, and looking at, you know, pictures 
you know, in Time Magazine of Linda Blair in full possession, you know. It's a great combination. It's very evocative and um, inspiring. So when we, a couple years later, when we're reflecting on things that we liked and we're writing these punk rock songs, you better believe that that's something we're going to throw out there to the world. Like, this is cool. This is this is what we're into, you know? And Exorcist Baby, you're really insane. But what about just the pure beauty of Linda Blair? Because she was gorgeous. Sure, yeah. Around that same time, you know, she she was making, she was doing all of her B films. Like She has a Rick James period and Roller Boogie. Awesome. I loved Roller Boogie. And then her pictorial in Wii Magazine. I don't remember if you remember that. Her nude pictorial in Wii was around the same time she was dating Jim, Rick James. And, uh, yeah, you know, she was this really interesting kid. Prior to that, she was in the pages of, you know, Tiger Beat Magazine, hanging out with Jim Dandy of Black Oak, Arkansas. So she was like a rock and roll Hollywood anti-hero teenager, you know? She was into, like, cool, weird shit, you know? I think we just vibed off that. And then, yeah, she's a turn-on. I mean, so many of these things were like, as a kid, I mean, it was very stimulating to be... 12 years old, going through, or younger, going through puberty, or about to, and then you see these pictures of like these 16 year old girls that are like the hottest, coolest, bitchy, like, you know, your friend's older sister that you're afraid of, with a, you know, with a Hamer Explorer, you know, and that's Lita Ford, you know, and it's like, and then Linda Blair's also this sort of like, um, you know, a turn on like you're saying, but then she's also, there's something very punk rock about her. She's, you know, throwing up green puke, you know? And so it's this weird combination. And in some ways, I feel like it sort of made me a feminist, you know? Because not only was I like, you know, moved chemically by these women, I was also admired them, you know? And I really respected them. I respected what they were doing, you know? So I think it's, you know, for me, it was a really, I think it, it sort of set the stage for a very positive um, relationship with females. What would you like your legacy to be? Oh my God, my legacy. Um, you mean, how do I want people to remember me? Sure. Um, well, <laughs> I haven't put much thought into that, to be honest, but um, I don't know. I don't really know what I'd like my legacy to be, but I know one thing is that I still am always trying so hard to show people what I can do. You know, I really, always, really, really, I don't know who I'm trying to impress, but um, it really means a lot to me to do the best I can do. And so I'm hoping at some point I get a sense that I've shown people what I can do and that... Um, and that that's what they remember me for. If you could collaborate with any living or dead musician, who would it be? The greats of rock and roll, you know, Mick Jagger, Paul McCartney, you know, those are, you know, uh, yeah, those are the top two that come to my brain. What are the pros and cons of social media to you? Uh, well, the pros are definitely um, supporting your friends, you know, maybe someone's sick, if you can help generate, um, you know, any kind of support for them, that's the number one best reason for it. And then also keeping up with people that you wouldn't norm normally see. Uh, the cons are that, um, you know, I mean, I think that uh, it's, it's an insulation that we, I tend to go to, but ultimately keep, make, put you in a lonely place, you know? I think that it's great to, um, you know, it's great to stay connected with people, but also if you just end up relying on it as the only way that you connect with people, then you ultimately feel unsatisfied and lonely. What is your greatest fear? I suppose we all are afraid of failing, and uh, yeah, on the deepest level that I'm somehow unlovable, uh, those would be this kind of, you know, that's, those are my most honest answers. What one life event would you change if you could relive it? I mean, any real legitimate regret, I don't think there's, there's not much of it out there for me because I like my life and everything is, in our, you know, the whole expression, it's a blessing in disguise. A lot of that's probably been the case, you know. Um, but, you know, in general, I think that I have reacted very emotionally at times to disappointments in my life. 
and I and at times I wish that and this is very general and vague but um, you know things like this like getting dropped from a record label dropped from a major record label when Red Cross got dropped from Atlantic after being on the label for less than a year I kind of took that on and felt like a failure I wouldn't feel that way anymore. I'd feel like that's their problem. Mm. And, you know, we're a weird ass band. I'm not going to take on um, their expectations. So, something like that would make sense. Who or what is the greatest love of your life? Well, my wife and my child. So, Anna and Alfie. How did you meet Anna Warnaker? And. What do you love most about her? Well, Anna, Anna Warrenker is my wife, and she's a, a very talented musician, singer-songwriter. Um, we first really um, met when Red Cross and her former band that's now playing again, That Dog, did a show together at the Roxy in um, around 94, 95. But I became a fan be prior to that. Okay, but what was it about her? Because you are an, um, a man that is in an industry where you have beautiful women thrown at you all the time. No, Anna's just, no, she is my, she's definitely my better half. She is, uh, she is, she's a better musician than me. She's funnier than me. And, um, I just feel very lucky to be with her. She, the thing that I, uh, the first thing that really, aside from being, you know, physically attracted, was that she's really funny, and we both bonded on the same movie the first time we really hung out, and then she also has an intuitive wisdom about her that is not quick to judge people. She's she's very open heart and she's not judgmental. Uh, She's unjudgmental in the right way. Those are obviously characteristics I value a lot. Yeah, it's hard to find a team member yeah. in this world. Most of them are pretty poison. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, the thing for me is I've always been a bit of a groupie. Like, I, t I talked about, you know, these bands that I was into. I've always been a female musician. I think that I like... Um, I like being with a partner that is... Um, yeah, I just I, I, I really like having that in common with my partner, you know, that uh, we both are passionate about something. It doesn't have to be about music, but that's the way it's been for us. And so it's been great going down this, you know, very difficult road to navigate at times with someone that totally understands. How did your son change your life? How did it change you as a person? He makes me wake up earlier. A lot of the cliches are true, you know. It just shocks you out of that realm of of being the center of the universe and um, especially as a musician, you know. That was all sorts of surprises, you know. And like when I first found out that I had a boy coming, I was uh, panicked a little bit because uh, First, after being relieved to learn it was a healthy boy, then it was like, a boy, I don't know anything about sports, what am I gonna do? And then I realized, don't worry about it. A, likelihood he won't be into sports because it's a music family, but then B, if he is, big deal, you can learn about it with him. And that's exactly what's happened. He's turned out to be the biggest NBA freak in the world, and it's been so much fun. Like, suddenly now, um, at our house, it's all, and it, and, I, and I feel it. I'm, it's totally authentic. I've had friends try to get me into sports before. The Melvins, biggest baseball fans, and I'd always feel like I'll go to this game. Sure, I had to have a hot dog, have a beer. This is fun to hang out. But the actual game itself, I felt like I don't understand what is the draw for you guys. And it seems, in some ways, I'm jealous that you're enthusiastic about something, but it also seems a bit like nerve-wracking and stressful to be a fan. But with Alfie, it's just, I totally get it. It feels totally authentic and genuine for all of us. And I've never felt more normal in my entire life, <laughs> in a good way. It's just those kinds of things. It's like, you just have to really reminding myself that you never know how things are gonna turn out. And you just gotta keep an open mind. And when something seems like that's not you, well, maybe you just need to open your mind a little bit more. What is your mission statement? Yeah, you know, I'm here to rock. I'm here to rock your ass. <laughs> I'm here to blow your you know, blow your head off, or you know. Well, this tour right now with the Melvins, we've got two bass players. Yeah. So you know, my my suggestion for the merch table was to have adult diapers, uh, like Melvins adult diapers, because our mission is to find the brown note and make everybody lose their bowels every night. 
So for now, that's my mission. Do you feel that fame is fleeting? And if so, what really matters at the end of the day? Well, yeah, fame does. I don't think that fame is um, at the end of the day. The, the, that's definitely not the mission. Um, I think that, yes, fame is fleeting. That's for sure. That's the part that doesn't really matter. That's the part of this whole thing that I suppose would get you... Um, you know, if you're actually really famous, you might get a table at a restaurant easier or something, you know. I think at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is uh, treat people the way you want to be treated yourself. If you want to be, if you want kindness, which I think most of us do, you don't want to be humiliated by other people, then don't do that to anybody else, you know. And I think I just try to put that out there, you know. And... And I think that's what matters the most, is just being a decent human being. From what I've been told, I, what I do makes some people happy, and that definitely gives some purpose, because sometimes I lose myself in just trying to, you know, support my family. I got to you know, go on tour, I got to support them, and we all, you know, it's like... You know, it's like that song, that, that bittersweet symphony or something mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah. you know, about Dude. how you, 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 what's the f opening line it about? Ultimately, like, d nothing matters. You, yeah, it's like you're burning, you're breaking your back just to make ends yeah. meet and then you die. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I think a lot of us feel that way. And sometimes we kind of forget to um, enjoy all of you know, not to sound corny, but the blessings, the really great stuff. And, uh, you know, I try to remind myself of that. I think about hearing the wisdom of elderly people that say, you know, what would you change? And just, I wish I could tell myself it was all going to be fine, you know, not to be so caught up and, and worried, you know. So I think those are the goals that I have, is to be in the moment, to enjoy playing catch with my boy for as long as it is, as long as he wants until he's bored, you know? It's like, I got to get into a zen state so that I'm not like, you know, making lists in my head about all that I got to take care of and just be there and get as much out of that moment as I can. What are your thoughts on the passing of Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington? Oh, it's horrible. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could get into all sort of gossipy, salacious. The guy sang at Chris Cornell's memorial, and then two weeks later, he's gone. Yeah, it's tragedy, you know, though. I mean, aside from all the potential conspiracy theory or whatever, I'd heard stuff, uh, a bunch of different stories. But I think the thing about it that's really hard for me to accept, though, well, one lesson, definitely, is that money doesn't bring you peace of mind. Or maybe it can, but it does not make your life suddenly good. You know, that's why we're, it breaks our brains trying to understand these stories. It's like, these guys are rock stars. These guys have financial security. These guys have millions of people that applaud for them when they walk on stage or whatever, thousands or whatever. And, um, and obviously that doesn't work. Um, the part, so that's a good reminder for people, at least in my business, but I think you can equate that to whatever job you do. Um, the thing that's hard for me to, to process is just that these guys were fathers. And I'm just, and in that it was a surprise to their bandmates or friends that it would happen. And I'm just kind of going like, you know, you get mentally well, you work out your shit, if you can't do it for yourself, then for Christ's sake, you're doing it for those kids because not only just to stay alive and support them, but it's like to not attach that legacy to their experience, you know? And also, there's so much goodness there, you know? Like whatever Chris Cornell couldn't get out of like that gig in Detroit that night, whatever you could think of, like, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe he was sad that they weren't as big as some other band or some whatever, or that, yeah, it's like, well, big deal, because you have these people that you brought to the party of life, and the way I kind of look at it, my lame metaphor is like, you know, it's that with the child thing, it's like, I sort of think of it like me and Anna, we insisted that this person come to this party. We, we insisted, no, you can't, you can't stay home tonight. You've got to come to this party. And now they're here, and it's our job to make sure they have good time you know because we insisted that they show up so if you just bail and you got another party to go to it's kind of a drag you know do you like the direction the world's going in today 
don't like the direction the world's going in. Uh, well, you know, yeah, that's a very general question. I have, I don't know. The pendulum is swinging very, very hard right now. It seems like, but, uh, um, but you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a little freaky sometimes, but it seems like it must be a natural thing. It's part of our our evolution as a as a, a species. So I'm gonna go with it. It's part of our de-evolution our, our de-evolution yeah. yeah 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 you know that's but, what's happening right now well we had a black president for eight years so to some that's a very extreme thing and so i guess it kind of makes sense that we're gonna you know i don't know there's lots of correctives hopefully the things are moving things hopefully things find their way into some sort of equilibrium steven yes thank you you will return yes great okay all right this is the blaring out with eric blair show with steven mcdonald signing off bye-bye the blaring out show <laughs>